So for today, we are going to be starting chapter 13. Uh, what is chapter 13 all about? Well, we're going to talk about how people behave in social settings. Basically, how do people act around each other? How do we influence each other? How do we decide to behave towards each other? All that sort of stuff. So this all falls under the umbrella of social psychology. And one of my favorite terms, and I use this in all sorts of classes, is going back to the idea that humans are social creatures. Whether you're looking at the evolution of human behavior, which is a fun class to teach, or you're looking at brain and behavior or intro psych, we're always talking about the fact that humans exist in a very social setting. So we live in family groups, we live in clusters within cities, we're going to have interactions with people. And when we were looking at those evolutionary perspectives in previous sections, we've always talked about the fact that human evolution would have happened many, many, many years ago when we were looking at people starting to form groups still in that hunting and gathering stage. But living in larger and larger groups can have a selective pressure, influencing things like intelligence, uh, language development, and many, many other things. So talking about us in terms of social situations is actually a really important and core component when referring to humans and why we are the way that we are. So in this chapter, we're going to look at how we perceive others, how we influence others, and how we behave towards others. Starting off with uh, a little bit of a here's a general term, specifically my here's our definition of the topic, social psychology, and then we're going to get into aggression and pro-social behavior as almost opposite ends of a spectrum. But first off, what is social psychology? This is the study of the causes and consequences of our social interactions. So we want to understand what prompts certain types of behaviors in those social settings but also looking at the consequences of those types of actions. Are people changing their behavior due to some kind of action of another? We've already referred repeatedly to the concept of reactivity, the idea that humans adjust their behavior when other humans are present. And it's not just humans, all animals will do this, but if we're aware that we're being watched, we're going to adjust our behavior. And a quick example of this, not just in terms of sort of reactivity from a broad setting, but even the context that you're in. If you're hanging out with your parents versus hanging out with your peers, I'm pretty sure the way that you talk is going to be very, very different. I find this is pretty obvious. Um, I've had people talk about it as my teaching voice, because if I get really into explaining a concept, regardless of who I'm sharing the info with, I kind of take on this lecture idea. Um, but it's very different from, say, a casual conversation. So you have different ways of acting in different situ situations. So all of this is our way of trying to understand and maybe even predict the behaviors of each other. And this is kind of cool because we can look at this from the side of the person producing behaviors, trying to influence the action of others. But we can also look at our own side of things from the receiving of actions of others. How do other people influence me? How do I change because of that? So you might choose sort of an outsider perspective looking at the whole system. You might look at how you can change your actions to change those of others or how you react to others. All of it falls under this umbrella. Um, this can also include some of those insights in terms of that evolutionary perspective where we can start looking at how we solve problems of survival and reproduction. So as always, when we mention evolution, we tie it to the concept of natural selection, because natural selection is the process through which evolution occurs. And we say this kind of in the exact same way every single time, but just in case it's not sunk in yet. And natural selection is all about having different traits, different adaptations that are going to allow you to survive and reproduce. Basically, we're looking at things that might have an inherent biological innate component that you could pass on to your offspring. And if you live longer and reproduce more, more of your offspring end up in future generations. You pass on more of those genes that influence those traits. So evolution acts to make beneficial traits more common in a population. Now, our definition of beneficial will change dramatically depending on the setting we're looking at. But in terms of that social setting, 
um, when we were describing our different personality traits that might allow us to work better in a group, things like having an extrovert who's willing to go out and interact with others and maybe facilitate interactions within a group might allow us to cooperate better and get more food and therefore survive longer. So we can tell that story of why that would be beneficial. So we can call that extroversion an adaptation. So that's sort of the way we're applying these concepts. So here we're trying to link behaviors towards others uh, in terms of how natural selection might act on those traits. So all of that, a little bit of refresher, a little bit of tying it to other topics, gets us into today's goal, which is to discuss aggression and pro-social behavior, which, like I was saying, is going to be kind of two opposing sides of a spectrum, where aggression is usually acting against others, whereas pro-social behavior is sort of our catch-all term for behaviors where you are working with others. Um, and we'll talk about different kinds of motivations for that too. But starting with aggression, uh, here we're talking about a behavior that is intended to harm another. Now I've inserted an asterisk here. This is one of those chapters. I actually went back and redid all of these slides because I have a couple of things I wanted to add. Um, so you'll find that a lot of this is added to what's in the text or slightly different because I've pulled from other sources. And this is one of those things. And that's a hang up on the term of intention. And it seems like a really weird thing to care about. Why would we be mad about using that word intention? And the reason is, as always, I don't just study humans. If you look at the literature across non-human animal species, people will actually get really, really mad if you talk about the intentionality behind an action. Instead, we're encouraged to say things like, you engage in this action and it leads to this type of consequence. We're using it in more of a passive form. Just like when we talked about communication, we might have mentioned the fact that communicating information, um, if you say that it's communicated with the intention of influencing the receiver's behavior, people outside of the human literature have problems with that. And it all ties to the idea of if you can't ask someone why they're doing something, how can you tell what their intention was? So if we're talking humans, this intended to harm another is fine but the asterisk is there because it is not always accepted. With that little rant out of the way, what kinds of aggression can we talk about? We have two separate labels that are fairly important, the one being reactive aggression and the other being proactive aggression, where reactive aggression is unsurprisingly in reaction to some other event. So this is going to be some kind of spontaneous response to a negative affective state. So something has set you off and you're going to lash out because of that. So this could be that maybe somebody shoves you and you shove them back, or somebody is shouting at you, so you yell back at them. So this is something where you are reacting to some existing state. In contrast, proactive aggression is something that's more planned and purposeful. So this is something where you're intending to carry something out, we're looking at humans, and you are sort of proactively planning this aggressive action. So this is usually with the attention, intention of achieving some kind of goal. So maybe you're playing sports and you're going to check somebody into the board so that you can get the puck first. That would be proactive aggression. Whereas if somebody shoved you and you shoved back, that's that reactive aggression. So it's all about planning and sort of that intentionality from that human focus. Um, when we look at where aggression comes from, there's all sorts of sort of random ideas and theories. And as per usual, because we only have a very short amount of time to discuss this, we're going to kind of land on each one of them very, very briefly and acknowledge that there are many, many other theories, other things that could be considered. But here's a couple of important ones. Uh, the first is our frustration aggression hypothesis. And this is one of those hypotheses that on the surface makes a lot of sense, but as we dig into it, we find that it's always more complicated than what we had originally thought. So simply, this hypothesis says that we are aggressive because we are frustrated. So frustration leads to aggression. So it kind of makes sense. It's the frustration aggression hypothesis. We're linking the two together. 
So we'd say that uh, individuals will become aggressive if, say, their goals are not achieved. They are frustrated in their attempts to accomplish something. So in these situations, you're going to get sort of that negative affective state. You're going to get really worked up and it's going to leave you to lash out because of that frustration. And some people might tap onto this, the idea that that lashing out due to frustration might actually be a way of venting some of that frustration. Um, so you might have heard of the uh, catharsis uh, hypothesis or the, the hypothesis or the catharsis theory, um, which I don't think is on the slide, but is something that comes up every once in a while. Um, but catharsis is one of those ideas that people would engage in aggression act aggressive actions specifically to try and get rid of those feelings of anger. So it's sort of an intended uh, venting of aggression. And in a lot of cases, people feel like that's something, again, it makes sense. I'm really upset, I go and I scream into a pillow or I go punch a punching bag and I feel better. But with lots and lots of studies looking into it, um, they actually find that it's not really helping. Um, it's mo mainly a placebo effect. Basically, people feel better because they think they should feel better. But when they've done a bunch of different controlled experiments, one of the ones I teach in other classes, um, we get to talk about a study where they have people come in and write an essay, and they have someone who's evaluating the quality of their essay. We can call them Steve. And Steve is a paid actor who's been hired basically to be uh, somebody that everybody hates. He's hired to be that guy who's going to give you terrible feedback, who's going to not just talk about how awful your writing is, but how awful you are as a person for writing this. And so we leave everybody feeling generally dissatisfied and frustrated. And then we have a group of people who, after being frustrated, go sit in a quiet room. We have some people who are sent to a room to hit a punching bag. And we have a group that are sent to a room with a punching bag and told to imagine Steve's face on the bag. And of course, if catharsis is something that's happening, after punching his face in your imagination for a while, you should feel better. They then have you go and do another task where you are able to deliver shocks towards um, sort of an unknown person whom you can imagine as Steve. And they look at the severity of those shocks. And if catharsis was true, we'd have those people who had punched Steve's imaginary face should feel better and be less aggressive. And in fact, they're actually still the most aggressive group. The others tend to be a lot more calm. And actually the group that sat in a quiet room are going to be the calmest of all of them. Um, so in this case, that gives us pretty good evidence that that doesn't quite work. And that pattern holds across lots of different experiments trying to figure out if we feel better, if we feel less angry and frustrated after venting, uh, and oftentimes we don't. Um, and if there is an effect, it's usually placebo, where we assume that we should feel better. Another one of the ways they test that um, is actually by getting people to read articles that either support or refute the catharsis theory and see if um, sort of venting makes them feel better. And if they've read an article that supports the theory, they are more likely to feel better, even if they engaged in exactly the same action. Um, so lots of cool stuff that gets into that. Um, but that's one component that relates to this frustration aggression hypothesis. And for both of them, they seem like they should make sense, but there's always more to it. So this theory that we are aggressive because we have some internal frustration is not really widely accepted any longer. Um, and some of the reasons for this beyond just the catharsis discussion is the fact that people can be really frustrated and not respond aggressively. Um, you might learn self-control. You might learn that this is something that always sets me off, but I have tools that will help me get through this. I don't have to be aggressive. I don't have to lash out in response to this. And whether that's because it's not an appropriate environment to engage in that, or it's not a healthy response, or whatever the reason is, you can have different people under sort of different levels of frustrative experiences, and their levels of aggression don't necessarily match with that frustration. Um, we also do find that aggression can come from way more places than just frustration, so that doesn't really support this either. So again, it can be part of it. Being frustrated can make you more likely to lash out, but it's not as direct of a tie as the original theory had proposed. So what else could be causing aggression? We know that there are tons of things that uh, have an influence. 
Uh, this one here is looking at heat and aggression. And I found this really neat. I love when textbooks include non-US data. So this is actually looking at Toronto. Not necessarily something super um, exciting to be proud about because we're looking at the mean number of shootings and the mean high temperature in Toronto between uh, 20, uh, 2004 and 2018. Um, but here we're looking at sort of this nice matching where the hotter months across these years tend to have a higher rate of shootings than those uh, sort of colder months. Um, and you'll actually find this isn't true just for things like shootings. This can also be true for things like general crime. So even if you look at, say, break-ins or robberies, they tend not to be as common in the winter. Um, and I kind of interpret that as nobody wants to be out when it's that cold, so that might have an influence there. Um, but yeah, so an interesting match here where we have that peak of more shootings when the temperatures are higher and fewer when they are lower. Um, what else can have an influence? Uh, we have tons of different biological influences, of course, and we're going to find there's some overlap. We keep talking about certain parts of the brain or certain systems as we look at different things throughout the semester. So if you've taken other classes where we talk about different parts of the body, a lot of this is familiar, but if not, we're kind of relearning it each time. Um, the first thing is, again, a callback to what we discussed back in personality and back in intelligence and will continue to come up. And this is the idea of heredity, basically having that inherent genetic component. So if we look at aggression and some measures of aggression, are there correlations between degree of relatedness and how aggressive your uh, family members are and how aggressive you tend to be? So if we look at our standard twin studies, identical twins are going to be more familiar or more similar in terms of aggressive actions than we would see in, say, fraternal twins, because those identical twins share more genes. And uh, even fraternal twins, even though they share 50% of their genes, they're going to be more similar than if we look at non-twin siblings. And as always, we point that out as a little bit interesting because our uh, fraternal twins and non-twin siblings, all of them just share 50% of their genes. But as twins, fraternal twins tend to have more similar environments, and that's what's usually credited for them being slightly more similar. Um, but that then also tells us that environment plays a role. And this pattern holds across pretty much everything we talk about. We talked about intelligence that has a strong genetic component plus environmental influences, Personality, we have a genetic component plus environmental influences. So here we're not surprised that if we look at a bunch of different measures of aggression, whether it's things like uh, if you have a twin who's been charged with an aggressive crime, how likely is the other twin to also have been charged? That tends to be a positive correlation. Um, but it could also be things like, uh, say, a questionnaire in terms of how often do you lash out, things like that those have all been done. There's lots of different measures you can use. The standards, though, are often uh, 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 arrest rates and things like that, because that's easier to quantify. Um, but it really depends on the study. What other biological stuff can play a role? Um, gender is actually a really strong predictor of not just aggression, but specifically the type of aggression that's employed. And this is kind of interesting to think about. And there's all sorts of behind the scenes explanations, but what's the general pattern? Um, men tend to be uh, involved in more of that sort of external physical aggressive act. So if we want some statistics, they're responsible for 90% of murders and 80% of violent crimes in the United States. So this tends to be predominantly male in terms of sort of outward physical aggression. And the way I like to visualize this, because of course, we don't have lots of experience with sort of crime stats and things like that. But if you think of, say, high school or middle school and you look at bullies, a lot of boys would bully by, say, pushing and shoving and fighting with each other. But if we look at girls and their bullying, it's not so much physical. It's a lot of that sort of catty, I'm going to sort of tear down your self-esteem. I'm going to start rumors about you. I'm going to socially exclude you. So that's not so much physical violence, that's a lot more sort of psychological, social violence. Um, so women's aggression tends to be more proactive, more planned, more intentional, less reactive and sort of outwardly violent. And it tends to be more verbal with that social harm component. 
So it doesn't just hold for middle school, it also holds sort of up to uh, adulthood. Um, and if we look at sort of that outward violence that tends to be associated more with men than women, um, there's a lot of things that they can talk about that might be responsible. Of course, we'll end up talking about testosterone because that's one of the things that's almost always mentioned in terms of aggression. Though I've said before that while it is called the male sex hormone, it is not just present in males. Um, and I always link it to things like PMS where cycling levels of testosterone can be uh, tied to things like frustration and aggression um, at that time. Um, we also have socialization, basically what is expected within society. So if we look at the social norms of how you should behave as a man versus a woman, um, there is a little bit more of an assumption that you should be a little bit more aggressive. And specifically that you should be aggressive in response to perceived threats. So things like if somebody challenges your social status or if somebody challenges your role or your um, sort of ability to be a stereotypical male, um, that's usually something that's designed to trigger an aggressive response. And again, think of things like if you're out at a bar, what tends to prompt somebody to lash out to push you back? Um, and it's either being physical yourself or challenging their ability to be physical. Um, it's kind of neat if you start looking at the psychology behind things like insults and reactions to them, it's a really fun time. Um, but yeah, if you challenge dominance or status, uh, that often prompts an aggressive response as well. Um, and then of course, if we're looking at testosterone, everyone's wondering sort of how strong of an effect is it? Because it's usually talked about either something that really doesn't matter or that it's sort of the be all and end all for aggression. And as always, it falls somewhere in the middle. So this is a visualization just showing one of their studies that they've done. So this was done by Van Hunk and Shutter back in 20 or 2007. Um, but basically what they had was subjects were given low doses of testosterone. So they have a control group who were just given a saline injection and then an experimental group given testosterone. And they were shown a whole bunch of different human faces. Now, this is an example of some of these faces, and they uh, sort of differ in terms of neutrality all the way up to being really sort of aggressive looking. And they would show you a face and ask you, how aggressive is this individual? And this one is kind of cool because it actually goes in the opposite direction that we would have thought. Because you think if testosterone is directly tied to aggression, that it should lead to maybe an inflation of your sense of threat. So you'd assume that people are more threatening because you're almost primed for an aggressive response. But in this case, they actually showed that they needed to see more of a display of aggression before they had their own evaluation of it being a threat. So in this case, they might have a more aggressive response after they've been sort of shown that this is a threat, but it might take them longer to recognize a threat. I will, as always, sort of point out that this is just a single study but this is one of the reasons why they say that it's maybe it's going to play a role for sure. There are lots of studies that show there are correlations, but it's not the be all and end all that it might be presented as. So a little bit closer to sometimes it has an effect, but it's not always as clear cut as we'd usually think. Uh, oh, and then I did have one more thing that occurred to me midway through that explanation, which is if we start looking at things like what we talked about back in personality, Things like self-identity and even things like self-esteem and how well or how good you feel about yourself can actually end up influencing how much of a threat you experience in those situations when you're challenged. Um, so if being a stereotypical male is part of your identity, then having somebody question that is very threatening to your self-view. But if that's not part of who you are and how you think of yourself, it's not so much of an attack. So internalization can actually have a dramatic effect on how you perceive those things, how much of a threat you take it as. Also things like self-esteem. If you're really confident in yourself, somebody else's opinion is not going to matter very much to you and therefore it's less threatening. But if you're already insecure, then it seems a lot worse. Um, that's sort of one thing I wanted to tie back before we moved on. All right, so what other biological influences? We will actually end up coming back to a couple more of those internal neurotransmitter hormonal components. 
but we can also look at physical structures. And again, we're getting this same message over and over again, which is the fact that there isn't really a clear on off or a clear, this is what's causing aggression. Every single time we're looking at something, even the frustration hypothesis to start, it's like it plays a role, but it's not the whole thing. Heat can play a role, but obviously not the whole thing. Um, testosterone can play a role, but it's not the whole thing. So we don't have any one structure in the brain that is going to turn on or off aggression. We of course have areas that we know are linked to it and are probably part of at least some of the pathways that are going to be activated when we are being aggressive, but they're never going to tell us the whole story. So we have two really big ones that we need to talk about. The first is probably pretty obvious. Our amygdala is involved in a lot of our emotional responses. And if we know anything about the amygdala, it's specifically that it's going to be related to fear and aggression. Um, so if we look over here, I borrowed this from a source far, far back, um, but our amygdala is sort of one of those uh, subcortical structures. This is our limbic system, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. We have our hippocampus, which we know is associated with memory and pulling information from our memories actually really close to our amygdala, which ends up making a lot of sense. Because if you remember something that scared you, or you remember something that made you really, really mad, you actually end up seeing the activation in the amygdala that corresponds to that emotion, even when it's just a memory. So we still have that sort of physiological activation, even from recall, not just from what's physically present in the moment. This is why if, say, you remember something that you're afraid of, you can actually have some of those physiological responses where your body starts ramping up for a fight. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of height. Um, I grew too tall too fast and fell off a lot of things that caused a lot of uh, injuries. So anything higher than say a step stool is very much not my thing. So if I start thinking about say going up on the roof of a building, I get that sort of curled shoulders, my palms get really clammy, my heart starts beating faster. And that's all our fight or flight response. So our autonomic nervous system, the part of our nervous system that works sort of reflexively or automatically ramps us up. And that ramping up is that fight or flight response where we start uh, getting ready to fight or run. So our heart rate increases to circulate blood, our lungs expand so we take in more oxygen, we actually redirect a lot of our blood flow, prioritizing our internal organs, which is usually why your fingertips start to feel a little bit cold, so you're not getting as much blood there. Um, even things like your eyes dilate so you can see better, and that should allow us to either run away really quickly or fight really effectively. There is technically a third response that you can have instead of just fighting, being aggressive in response to a threat or running away from a threat, we also see something called the freeze response. And for our freezing, it is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of fighting or running, you almost end up shutting down. And it seems really weird. You're facing a threat and your response is to basically stand there and do nothing. What's going on? But if you think of it, there are other species that are actually famous for this. Possums play dead in response to a threat. And it's actually an evolutionary thing where if you are stationary, um, you are less likely to be noticed. A lot of predators are going to be searching for movement, something to follow, something to latch onto. So if you stop moving, you might escape notice. So that freeze response, while on the surface it seems kind of maladaptive, can actually be really helpful. So it's probably a lot more, um, say, correct to talk not just about a fight or flight response, but the fight, flight, or freeze response instead. Um, and all of that runs through this system where our amygdala would be responsible for activating if we experience something that triggers an emotional response. And we can again talk about areas we've mentioned before. We talked about our reticular activating system in the last chapter, something that gets involved for some of our personality traits. And we said that that's all about filtering what in our environment is important or not. And that would be stuff coming up through the brainstem here, through our hindbrain into the midbrain, and then sending information off to the rest of our brain. And as that information comes in, maybe in our periphery, we've seen what is sort of bear-shaped. 
something sort of dark, furry, four legs um, moving towards us, that would automatically register as very, very important. And when that signal comes up, the reticular activating system and associated structures says, this needs to be sort of the top of the list, pay attention to this. The thalamus gets the signal. Our thalamus is our relay station, our routing system. It's gonna send some of that information off to the amygdala basically to say, okay, you need to be afraid. We need to start recruiting everybody for our fight or flight. Let's get everything going. Um, that amygdala is also going to be involved with our hypothalamus, which we've mentioned before. Our hypothalamus is what we talk about when we talk about homeostasis, uh, monitoring our bodies and keeping things in balance. But if we're facing a threat, we tell the hypothalamus that the rest of the body needs to be ready for this threat. So that's actually what activates our autonomic nervous system. It ramps up our sympathetic nervous system, the subcomponent, that's going to trigger that fight or flight response. So the amygdala gets its signal from the thalamus. The thalamus got all that upcoming sensory information from the rest of the body. We've decided things are threatening and our hypothalamus triggers that full body response. Um, the hypothalamus is really cool because it not only has the ability to pick up electrical signals from bits and pieces in the brain, so it picks up on neurons sending action potentials, but it actually also monitors for and releases hormones as well. So it's not just part of the nervous system, it's part of our endocrine system too. So the nervous system is an electrical signal carried on from the action potentials and our uh, endocrine system is all about hormones sending stuff throughout the bloodstream. So in that case, it's going to help with that sort of systematic activation. So all of that is sort of talking where we can see where this is happening, but all the words are still on the slide that I advanced from where we've said, all right, our amygdala is involved in those emotional responses, determining that something is a potential threat, and we get increases in activity in the amygdala when we are experiencing threats. We should note that when this happens, when the thalamus sends some of that information forward to the amygdala, the amygdala is going to be a little bit more likely to say, interpret things as more threatening than they might be. So it might panic, it might hit the start the fight or flight response button a little bit prematurely because maybe what you thought was a bear is actually a dog. And it's gonna take you a little while to activate sort of the parts of your brain that let you go, oh yeah, no, we're like dead in the middle of the city and there's somebody walking right behind it who's not afraid, that's definitely a dog. And that's why the thalamus sends some info to our, oh, sorry, to our amygdala, point to the wrong spot, and it sends some of that info off to the rest of the brain to be processed properly. But again, evolutionarily speaking, having a fast response to something that might be threatening is actually beneficial. So even though we might uh, waste a ton of energy by getting ourselves really worked up, it's a lot better to be worked up and not have a threat happen and waste the energy than it is to not respond, to dismiss a potential threat and then get attacked. Because again, it's all about survival and not bracing for an attack is not great for surviving. So that system works as a nice check and balance where our amygdala can have its sort of panic response, set everything up, you freak out a little bit, but the rest of the brain, the rest of our cortex can figure out what we're seeing and say, actually, you can calm down, it's just a dog. And of course, that's then going to tell our amygdala to reduce activation which then tells our hypothalamus to reduce the signals to the rest of the body, and we get back into our normal balance. We like to not be afraid if we don't have to be. And our understanding of a lot of this actually ends up coming from lesion studies or stimulation in, uh, studies with rats, because um, rats are pretty easy to study, and uh, there's lots and lots of models that let us understand how their brains work. But if you electrically stimulate either the amygdala or the hypothalamus in certain areas, you can actually trigger more aggressive responses. Uh, similarly, if you deactivate or damage certain areas, you can actually reduce the likelihood of aggressive responses because those structures aren't functioning to be able to trigger those responses. And one of my favorite studies, it's not on the slides or anything at all, but it actually helps illustrate that difference where the thalamus sends some information forward for the amygdala to sort of really quickly identify threats, 
and it sends some information to the rest of the brain for the slow processing. But if you have a rat and you've lesioned their occipital lobe, you've gotten rid of their primary visual cortex, where we process all of our incoming visual information, you can actually still classically condition that rat to be afraid of a visual stimulus. And that seems really weird. You have a blind rat who you can show something and they'll be afraid of it. So how does that work? It's all about the thalamus sending info to the amygdala because our amygdala triggers a fear response. It actually has a little bit of an ability to process things like incoming visual signals. So even though we haven't processed it back here and figured out that we're seeing something, um, our amygdala is able to trigger that response regardless. Um, but I found it really neat when I learned that, because of course I study conditioning, um, but to see that you can condition a visual response in a blind rat is just very cool to see. All right, before I go off on more tangents, because there's all sorts of really cool stuff we can get into when looking at aggression in the brain, um, we do have a couple of other familiar areas. So our frontal lobes, we've mentioned many, many times, especially in that prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is sort of the frontal lobe, but down, still underneath and at the front, that's sort of that area. But it all falls together because our frontal lobe is all about that processing and interpreting and integrating information from many areas. So if we talk about executive functioning, um, our ability to uh, weight information, to do things like uh, short-term and working memory, if we're manipulating things, um, say doing mental mathematics or evaluating choices, all of that's creating activation in those frontal lobes. So if we have reduced activity in those areas, we're having a lot less of that consideration. We're maybe not looking at consequences of actions. We're not able to make sort of logical choices Maybe we're a lot more impulsive, and that's supported in a bunch of different studies, some of which are looking at things like, again, you go into uh, sort of people who've been arrested for certain types of crimes, and if you look at those who've been arrested for violent crimes, but non-planned violent crimes, um, so things like second-degree murder, where you didn't intend to kill them, but it happened in the moment, uh, they tend to show less activation in those frontal lobes. Um, which implies that there might be more impulsivity there. Um, another thing that's not on the slides but relates to this is there's actually a specific gene, uh, the MAO3, I believe. Um, but if you look it up, they actually call it the rage gene, which as always is a media thing. Um, but this gene, if you have a mutant version of it, uh, it basically means that it doesn't function. And this is something that's supposed to help break down some of our neurotransmitters. So if we have a non-functional version, we end up with buildups of neurotransmitters in places there shouldn't be. And what this ends up leading to is a buildup of stuff that interferes with activity in the frontal lobes. So these individuals tend to be more impulsive, especially under stressful situations. Basically stuff builds up and builds up and builds up until they lash out. Um, so if you're curious, there's actually a documentary on it. Um, when I have time in classes, sometimes we'll show it, but it's called The Rage Gene. And the researcher who discovered it actually goes out and interviews people and tests if they have the gene or not, basically showing that having that gene is not deterministic, doesn't guarantee that you're going to be a violent criminal. Uh, and he actually found that in his studies, he has a mutant version of that gene himself, um, but has never been aggressive. So it's a really cool documentary if you're curious. Um, but there's all sorts of things like that where we're slowly starting to see that small things can contribute. But again, none of them are driving aggression. None of them are guaranteed to explain aggression. They're all just bits and pieces that end up working together as a more cohesive whole. And of course, we don't have a specific aggression chemical, but we can find correlations between certain levels of certain chemicals and aggressive tendencies. So still not deterministic, just correlations. So as always, higher levels of testosterone are typically associated with greater levels of social aggression. This is often going to be things like uh, displays uh, that show that you are big and strong and tough, as well as more of those reactive displays if 
that sort of uh, social status is questioned. Um, and this works not just with humans in other species as well. More dominant individuals in other species tend to have higher levels of testosterone. Um, we also see that actually serotonin is related to aggression. So lower levels of serotonin are associated with higher levels of aggression. So this could be something like um, serotonin is often associated with, uh, say, mood stabilization, and having it be really low might mean that you are more susceptible to reactive aggression. Um, but we don't have sort of a direct tie here. A lot of it is still fairly theoretical, as per usual when it gets to neurotransmitters. Uh, what else can we have as influences? We can talk about uh, uh, cultural influences on aggression, which we've already kind of mentioned when we talked about our sex differences. Um, but of course, culture and the stuff that we're surrounded with, the stuff we're exposed to, is for sure going to affect how we view aggression. So here we're saying that it's affecting our standards of aggressive acts. Um, so things might promote or discourage aggression. So if you're surrounded by a group that's really pro-violence, um, maybe, uh, I always like looking at hockey culture where people, especially in Canada, we look at Canadians and we think, oh yeah, calm, chill people. But if you get a bunch of Canadians at a hockey game and somebody starts fighting, it's a very different environment. And in those cases, aggression in sports is something that's actually expected. It's not just tolerated. So in these cases, we're saying that that environment is setting these social expectations of how you should behave. Um, and this can tie to all sorts of things. This could be things like um, what is considered a crime or not. Um, this could be things like what is common to observe when you're walking the street. Um, is, say, uh, verbal aggression. If you look at uh, drivers in New York City, you almost expect them to be verbally aggressive. People are always shouting at each other, swearing, honking horns, and that's the norm. So different standards are going to breed different expectations, and we often adjust our behavior to match those expectations. We'll end up talking more about social norms later in the chapter, but it definitely relates here. Um, we can find things like uh, culturally, with those rules of what is and is not permitted, um, we find that uh, murder rates correlate with gun ownership per capita. So in these cases, having access to that is going to influence the actions. Um, you can also have exposure to violence correlates with violent acts. And this is an interesting one because there's been an ongoing debate about uh, increases in violence on TV. Um, if, even if you go back to even like the 50s when TV started to be something that was sort of entering into homes, before that, people didn't have them. And then people would have sort of one TV that everyone watched together, and then it got more and more. But they started putting regulations on what could and could not be shown because all of a sudden, aggression and violence was really commonplace and right in people's faces. So that started it, where people were wanting to see, is there a long-term effect? And as time has gone on, and even with things like rating systems, well, you can still have R-rated movies, and those are still um, something you can go and see. And people would argue, well, is that making people more uh, desensitized to violence? Are they then themselves more likely to be violent? And of course it becomes, well, what about video games? Now, when you look at some of the top selling video games, uh, first person shooters tend to be very high on those lists. And there's all sorts of controversies about certain levels in certain games that have really riled people up. And all of this is something that's been ongoing from different angles. And of course, they've done lots and lots of studies, but there's always the caveat that while we do often find positive correlations between amount of exposure and amount of aggressive acts, there are almost always other factors that need to be considered. And my favorite example of this is if you think about, uh, so let's look at children and exposure to violent TV. So you have kids, and if they're sitting there watching uh, HBO shows, they're then more likely themselves to go out and be violent. But if the child is unsupervised, they are both probably more likely to be watching whatever the heck they want on TV, but also not supervised and might go out and encounter situations where violence might occur. So in those cases, other factors can play a role. And that also ends up correlating with socioeconomic status. So if you think about lower income homes, you're more likely to see either single parents or parents that need to be out of the house more often to work, leaving their children unsupervised. 
So all of these things end up being a lot more complicated than just if you watch violent TV, you are yourself going to be violent. Um, so I always sort of stress that component. But if you do look at studies and if you look at the media headlines that interpret those studies, you'll be seeing things like, oh, violent video games cause increases in violence, which is definitely too clean cut and not the case. Um, so how does some of this work? What are some of the things they think is going on? Uh, some of it can tie to modeling, which we've mentioned before, where people learn to behave a certain way by watching others. Well, if you're playing these games or watching TV shows and you see people act the particular way and maybe they're praised, I love looking at those sort of crime procedurals. So you have your detectives going out and they're solving a case and they get the bad guy. And most of the time, if you look at the studies of sort of rates of arrest versus killing them, uh, most of the time they just kill them. And they're praised as heroes. They've saved the area, they've got the bad guy. And that's sort of showing that this kind of aggression, if justified, is then sort of positive. And that can skew your perspective, especially if you can justify other actions maybe outside of the law. Um, so you start believing that aggression can be rewarded. And if you go to video games, well, the more enemies you kill, the more experience you get, the stronger your character. That's the whole goal. So again, we're sort of reinforcing aggressive acts. And the more realistic games are getting, they're arguing that there's the potential for desensitization to that violence. Um, this one I love to point out has some follow-up studies. Once again, they like to consider other things, um, but people are very good at separating what is okay in a video game versus what is okay in the real world. This is something where people would argue that it blurs the lines between fantasy and reality, but a lot of the studies, people are going to behave with very different sets of morals in a game versus in person. 